It was only ISRO that was doing stuff. You were the India. first. We first are ever? the first Indian private company to launch an imaging satellite. We're the only one still date that has an operating satellite up there. Our product is the data, the information. We are in the information business. Hmm. What someone from Amazon, in hypothetical example, they would want to know about lithium deposit somewhere, they would come to companies like us and say, "Hey, you have hyperspectral imager. You can very clearly see where lithium is. We are going to pay you for an image over this area." So what we do is we. Sell them the images of hmm. that area. Or someone could come in and say, "Hey, I don't want anyone else getting images of this area. I'm going to pay you 10x the amount. Yes. Don't sell it to anyone else. It's exclusively mine." At graveyard orbit. What are some cool like extreme satellites? I think uh, one cool satellite I remember had nuclear radioisotope thermal generators. So they were testing instead of solar panels, instead of batteries, can we use nuclear power? Can- What is up, my friends? Coming to you live from Indira Nagar, Bangalore. My name is Vinamrit Kasana, and welcome to Dost Cast. Today's guest is. an unlikely one you've heard of entrepreneurs building for india you've heard of uh, global entrepreneurs building for the world but have you heard of founders building for space that's right today's guest is avesh ahmed of pixel a company that specializes in sending satellites up into space and uh, clicking hyperspectral images if you don't know what that is you will find out in this podcast it is a mind blowing episode because he ended up meeting elon musk sending his first satellite shakuntala into space the only private company who's done that and just so you know as far as the wikipedia is concerned the company has raised a total of 33 million dollars on company on this but all it means to say is that there is clearly more optimism in space tech than many of us would like to believe this is one of those conversations where i felt like there is so much more to the world than what i know This insane mind blowing episode all about space exploration and technology with the Vesa Mato Pixel begins in 3 2 1 What's up everyone we've got the man from space here on earth Avesh Ahmed how's it going brother It's going good They're going busy but going good thank you for having me Thank you for being here I've never had the pleasure of having someone like you here who splits his time between LA and Bangalore not because they have to meet silicon valley funders but because space The industry as we know it operates in LA. You know, first off the bat, those heavy clickbaity questions. What was it like meeting Elon Musk? <laughs> it was a dream come true. The reason why we participated in the Hyperloop competition was to meet him, not so much to participate in the competition. And yeah. we got to take a selfie with him. So, uh, yeah, good. I mean, he doesn't really remember me, <laughs> um, but it was good. What's funny is that you actually became a finalist in the Hyperloop competition just to meet him, which means to say, like, you know, like there's this casual genius, like Good Will Hunting. I think it's more a matter of luck. Yeah, we the the entire reason for deciding to participate in the competition was saying, uh, hey, you know what? We, we might just get a chance to meet Elon, yeah. and then we kept getting through one round after the other, and then we had to really figure out shit to build it. So yeah, good. I think it turned out well. And what was he like beyond the selfie? Did you have an interaction with him? Not no? really. No, I think he asked a few questions about the Hyperloop pod that we were building. He was surrounded by his children and his bodyguards, so not a lot of interaction. He had a couple of questions about the uh, the technicalities, and he just went away. So he was a lot more sane back then as well. Yeah. Now he's uh, with Twitter, so he's like taking full steam ahead. Out of super curiosity, bro, because I have no idea. I understand briefly from what I've read is Hyperloop is some kind of fast moving technology that allows vehicles to go from one place to the other super fast beyond that i'm clueless can you <laughs> help me understand what hyperloop basically is yeah so it's it's still a futuristic concept in the is it it's a hope of people that it will be a mode of future transportation maybe 5 years maybe 10 years what it essentially is is um, you you build a vacuum tube and the reason why you build a vacuum tube is because The reason why trains can only hit a certain speed, even high-speed trains, is at a certain point uh, called the Kandrovitz limit. Air friction really starts to hamper your speed. The faster you move, the more the air friction increases. So to remove that Kandrovitz limit, uh, you build a vacuum tube, and so therefore now you don't have air within the tube, and you can accelerate your pods, uh, the Hyperloop pods, um, to much higher speeds, nearly the speed of sound. Hmm. Um, uh, What you can also leverage within the tube is you can levitate the pods. You have magnets, uh, like you have maglev, but essentially yep. maglev within a hyperloop tube, meaning you can travel at really, really fast speeds uh, uh, without air friction. That's essentially what it is. So, what's the problem with the hyperloop? Because it's been around for a while. There's been a lot of conversation around it, but like, say when you were building a prototype, uh, why does it not have global implementation the way Elon said it would? It. any technology worth its way takes some time to reach commercialization right uh, the right brothers flew their plane in 1903 1904 it was not until 20 years later that people commercially on a regular basis even started flying it and even then it wasn't really very popular mm-hmm. um it took 
till the second world war for it to actually reach a point where you could say yeah you know now we can use it on a daily basis so hyperloop uh, requires a lot of capital investment right and governments are all mo- not always willing to put so much money yeah. which is why i said it's still in the future um, there's a few countries that are willing to put money into it um, the flashy ones now like saudi or uae but um, until we see someone put in sink in a lot of money um, that they might not earn back for decades we won't see it Uh, trains for example have never made money profitably right it's always been the government that has all across the world has, including our our trains in yeah if system. you look at the overall amount of money put into trains uh, versus the amount of revenue that they generate they've never really generated money because it's always been the government that has built it as infrastructure because you know people need and goods need to move around i was a big fan of that train food bro i thought like they were doing really well but i know already that they're not as successful as they are slated to be at least in terms of their marketing no they are but o- overall the initial amount of investment that just went in no one really yeah. made money the railroad barons didn't really make money from the railways as such yeah and as far as hyper- hyperloop is concerned i think governments are more interested in building super highways more feasible to to build super highways from say mumbai to bangalore or mumbai to delhi than to invest in something like that and uh, out of curiosity what like what is the disc on which a car is placed like what is that made out of and how does that work out so there's no disc right so um, the way at least we built it and uh, the and the way we envisioned it hyperloop india was you would have uh, magnets underneath the pod you would have wheels to start off like a normal car and instead of a railway track you would have an aluminum track now what's the catch a railway track is made of what and as opposed to what you were saying um no it's it's a flat aluminum track okay. right there's no there's just no gauge and aluminium. things like just a strip of aluminum that's laid down like a road and you have magnets underneath it so once the hyperloop pod starts moving at a certain speed the changing magnetic field leads to uh, electric currents eddy currents in the aluminum sheet which in turn creates its own magnetic field mm. which then repels the magnetic field of the magnets that are there and that is what levitates it so it needs to reach a certain minimum take off speed as such for it to levitate and then at a certain point the the force of gravity trying to bring the pod down and the magnetic force pushing it upward balance out mm. and then uh, the pod keeps on moving and what about the acceleration how does that happen the initial acceleration could happen in a variety of different ways you could have a normal motor that is accelerating it on wheels up to a certain point after which levitation takes over um, and um, the other way of doing it is an electric induction motor um, which essentially is uh, um, using rotating magnets to propel it forward rather than pushing it up so it's the same basic concept as magnets pushing the pod up but oriented in a different way so that now you have uh, this uh, pod moving um, there's also ideas uh, where there's aluminum plating on the side of the tube as well in which case uh, that's where the the push happens from instead of from from bottom so there's multiple ways of you know providing the power it's actually levitating it mm. where the the trick really happens yeah. and when you were making this did you make um a prototype did you just make some stuff up on slides like what were you did you actually physically build something <laughs> we physically built something so um, i'll tell you how it came to be i managed to stumble into the room of one of my seniors uh, and his room this is bits pilani mm-hmm. in the middle of a desert pilani um i was there to meet his roommate but then i saw this person scribbling something about the hyperloop on the whiteboard and since i also followed elon musk and he was tweeting a whole lot about the hyperloop in 2017 um we got to talking hey you 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 are you're looking at the hyperloop you know um and then he said oh there's this competition by elon musk and spacex why don't we participate and so that's how it got started and as i said the, the thinking in my mind was uh, you know it's a good chance to maybe meet elon if he gets selected to be one of the finalists but we were never really serious about it but thankfully for some reason the first design got got through and then spacex came back saying why don't you submit a more detailed proposal we submitted that we got through that and they said you need to now send us a very detailed package of how do you actually manufacture and build it what would be the safety considerations we did that and they said hey you know we are giving you permission to go ahead and build it which is all great uh, except that we had no money no expertise to actually manufacture it um and less so in uh, less so in pilani um where the only thing that you could use to do it was the mechanical workshop uh, used for teaching mechanical engineering which was not good for a whole lot of things so we decided we would come down to bangalore during the summer holidays um and in return for sponsorship logo on the pod some people were willing to 
manufactured things for free and we managed to put it together so in a span of 3 months um to our surprise we managed to put a hyperloop pod together that was in working condition and shipped it all the way to los angeles in the span of things there was a lot of adventure where custom documents got uh, missed out in hong kong and it got stuck for 3 days in us customs but yeah in the end we managed to get it to the the spacex parking lot where the competition was happening i'm sorry how big is this is this a kilometer long no the the pod is not a kilometer long the t- tube was a mile long uh, the tube the, hype, the the tube which was a demonstration tube but they the, had that like they had that yeah, built yeah. right so that that spacex said that they would build the pod itself was probably 15 feet in length and about 5 feet in width and 7 feet in its height insane man so oh, you, you could you yeah. could fit one the, the the challenge stated you sh- you should be able to fit one person into the pod we just had space for one tiny person to fit into the pod yeah you can say indian average height is less and <laughs> carry with that uh, but but were you, did you were you always building things as as complex as a pod and now satellites as a kid where did you acquire this where with all to start building physical objects honestly i think when we started doing it none of us had the wherewithal to do anything with a hyperloop um, but i've always been attracted to things that were hard um, i think that's just how i was brought up maybe by reading too much science fiction watching too much science fiction um, those things always fascinated me so the first thing that i did when i joined bits was be part of the student satellite team mm. where scientists at isro were teaching the student satellite team to build a satellite right mm. uh, that was very complex uh, i learned uh, hell out of a more there than i did in any course for that matter because it was actual real engineering in the real world mm. uh, which encompassed everything from mathematics to orbital physics to electrical engineering to mechanical engineering um so that was my first actual brush with working on anything hardware i didn't really uh, i was not really a tinkerer or a hacker before that um but the first experience was was tinkering with the student satellite that we were building at bits and then the hyperloop opportunity uh, and then that that led to pixel later so it's always been something or the other that uh, seemed cool honestly some anything that seemed futuristic was something that attracted me yeah. something you you went all head on a uh, super basic question because i don't know i don't know what a satellite looks like <laughs> i've seen some solar panel tubes a rocky like thing i've seen several renditions of international space stations in the thousand movies <laughs> i've watched about space <laughs> but in essence what what is a satellite made of like what what are the basic components of a satellite in the most basic sense uh, a satellite is a computer in, in space that has a few additional peripherals it has a solar panel for it to generate power it has batteries for it to store power mm. and it has uh, certain actuators to move it around except those things it's essentially a computer you are writing software code and automating it and telling it you're going to see these conditions in space in an orbit and you need to do this 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 if you come across this latitude you need to image um if you see the sun this way you need to point your solar panels towards it so mm. in essence it's a glorified computer with solar panels and batteries and certain actuators on it um but um what you what that computer is for in space is for some kind of an instrument to do something from from space uh, that instrument could be a camera for taking images of the earth that instrument could be a radio for helping connect two places on earth and you have many satellites and you can connect any place that's what mm. you know starlink is doing so that's that's what it is uh, anything that or technically speaking anything that orbits a planet is a satellite mm. uh, what you're talking about are artificial satellites which is us leveraging the the beautiful physics of uh, an orbit by saying okay the rocket is going to deploy it in this orbit and it is going to keep orbiting until gravity brings it down uh, yeah. atmospheric friction brings it down but yeah you're just writing a piece of code saying just make sure that you survive and you do this mm. and actuators are just uh, thrusters like are they thrusters that allow you to uh, elevate in the air and they're powered by fuel or they're powered by solar power there are uh, a few different actuators so thrusters are are one kind of propulsion uh, actuators um it could be electric propulsion in which case the power is coming from solar panels but those generally don't have uh, high thrust um the, you know they take time to do something because you can't generate enough power for you to use electric power or electric propulsion there then there are chemical propulsion thrusters as well which are essentially mini rockets you have yeah. you know a fuel and an oxidizer and you are saying burn and then it burns and it moves you around but thrusters are mainly used for changing orbits mm. uh, you you're telling it you're in in this orbit you change it to this orbit or you move up in your orbit you come down in your orbit 
but there are other actuators that are required for changing the attitude of the satellite so there are two words altitude which is the height and then there's an attitude of the satellite and by that i don't mean you know its character it's mm. its orientation Bad in space satellites not that yeah. <laughs> it's orientation in space so there are two main actuators people use one is uh, called a reaction wheel so it's essentially a wheel that ensures that due to the conservation of momentum laws if the wheels are rotating in a certain way the satellite rotates in a certain way mm. and the other is called a magnet torquer um it is essentially a coil of wire from which you are extracting power from the solar panels and running the electricity there which leads to a magnetic field there are three of those in three orientation and you know what magnetic field of the earth is in space so you simulate a magnetic field on the satellite saying interact this way with the earth's magnetic field to move around um so yeah magnet torquers reaction wheels are the major ones for attitude for altitude and orbit it's thrusters propulsion units and how long does it take for a satellite to remain in space is there a fixed time that you can code in uh, what does it take to bring it back can it be brought back or does it become inactive or floats away like it's uh, stranded yeah the, the higher the satellite is in terms of its altitude the uh, longer it remains there so geostationary satellites are at 32000 kilometers um, from the surface 32, of the earth 32000 kilometers That's what you right. were going to say is feet. That's <laughs> where airplanes fly. That's right. Yeah. Um and at that altitude there is no atmospheric friction at all. We are way way beyond any semblance of the atmosphere of the earth. And so what happens at the end of life is companies and organizations and agencies send this satellite at the end of life using remaining propulsion or fuel at the end of life to a graveyard orbit. there is a graveyard orbit a cemetery in space where all dead satellites go to spend the rest of their life um and then the, the closer you come so we operate in low earth orbit not geostationary orbit so low earth orbit which is about 500 to 1000 300 to 1000 kilometers from the surface of the earth 500 to 600 is where most of the satellites are international space station is at 350 so these satellites if they are at 500 or 300 the closer they are the more f- atmospheric friction they mm. will come across because you are beyond the atmosphere kind of but there's still some semblance of gases there which adds up over lifetimes um so at say a 300 km altitude you would deorbit and burn up in the in the atmosphere in a span of less than 2 years versus at a 500 to 550 km altitude it could take 5 years or 6 years but uh, you burn up and completely just demolish as a satellite yeah yeah so this all all satellites um general the gen- nominal satellites i'm not talking about very very large satellites for specific purposes but most satellites when they are brought down the friction is so much they all burn up there's nothing left of it um yeah uh, unless you build it very specifically with heat shield and everything which no one does because yeah. it's, it's a waste of money if you do that but yeah at the end of life they burn up it's a, it's a bad ass ending for a satellite do you ever study graveyard orbits i'm sure there must be one science fiction story where like there's an ancient civilization <laughs> in graveyard orbits but like that's i've never heard of that i always thought that they just kind of remain but is there a graveyard orbit for the world which is a standard or is there separate graveyard orbit orbits for separate countries and operators it's just one graveyard orbit it's an internationally accepted orbit where the united nations uh space coordination something something so there's a part of the united nations that coordinates all space activities um uh, and uh, unusa um uh, which which brought all major countries together and they all agreed to say yeah we are going to put all our dead satellites in this orbit so that's the yeah. designated graveyard orbit what are some cool like extinct satellites that you know i'm sure like there have been several satellites that have come in the uh, atmosphere in, in space what are some ones that you remember like you know like that that one from 65 or 70 or 80 So I think uh, one cool satellite I remember had within those satellites uh, uh, nuclear radio isotope thermal generators. So they were testing instead of solar panels instead of batteries can we use nuclear power can we just put some nuclear fuel and as it decays it lets off heat and then using that heat you can generate power and and that will go on for tens of years if not hundreds of years. and russia was was launching these satellites and you know they they didn't end up getting to orbit and so the the crash land the satellite crash landed somewhere and um, no one ever really found those uh, uh, rtg generators again so i think that was that is a cool story i remember that's crazy man uh, there's so many other questions i want to ask you about this so you launched your first satellite with elon musk's spacex right obviously we talked about your elon musk elon musk story um But honestly, we're sitting here in Indira Nagar, and it is beyond me. It's surprising that someone who looks like me, speaks like me, could just work on these giant machines and send them to space. 
So anywhere from regulation to setting it up to shipping it abroad, and you said you spend your time, spend your time between LA and uh, uh, Indra Nagar. What does it take? Actually, take like from the inception to all the way to the launch to launch a satellite into space. And why does like say someone like SpaceX decide that hey, we're gonna invest in this startup from India and like launch the satellite into space? So I think the launching with SpaceX was a straightforward business proposition. They are like a train which uh, goes up four times a year. Um, we pay for the train, a ticket to get up there. We reserve our spot. They take us from point A, which is Earth, to point B, which is in space. So it's, it's essentially, <laughs> in essence, uh, like a train. Um, but in terms of you know getting from from when we started while still in college to to here. Honestly, we were very naive when we started. We thought it would be a hell of a lot easier than it eventually ended up being, hmm. uh, because of a hyperloop experience. So I remember sitting one evening while the manufacturing of the pod is going on and looking at thirty undergraduate students from Bits, right, who have never had any semblance of normal work experience before, almost realizing a hyperloop pod uh, competing hmm. against postgraduates and PhDs of uh, the MITs of the world. Um, that's when I think that that instilled a little bit of a false sense of confidence and naivety that if we can build a hyperloop pod, maybe building a satellite is easier because people have done it before. And yeah. like the case of hyperloop, there's a lot of material on the internet that we could read and and use for building it. We could tap into yeah. scientists at ISRO who have either retired or still there to to help guide us. Uh, and none of your team are aer aeronautical engineers by training at that at that point. No, <laughs> it uh, it was me, uh, and then once I pitched the idea, my co-founder Shitij uh, in 2019, and then a few months after that, we had our two founding engineers from the same batch. All of us 2019 graduates from Bitspilani. None of us knew how to build a satellite. <laughs> that is insane. So, again, you saw these undergraduates. You figured like you know you had this naive sense of confidence <laughs> that you could do it. But was it, like what raw materials do you gather? How do you find warehousing space? to essentially assemble a satellite together and then figure out this will ship from India to US. Like, can you take me to the micro details of how that happened? <laughs> so our first workspace was actually a, a metro station away. So we're in Indranagar. You get on Indranagar metro, the next metro you will find is Halsur metro station. Okay. Under Halsur metro station, there was a maker space. And the maker space was for obviously doing small kinds of electronics. So we decided... Uh, to you know, start some sense of manufacturing there because we thought, oh, there's a 3D printer. We could probably 3D print some things. Um, none of that ended up flying, of course, because it requires an entirely different level of uh, manufacturing. So initially, the idea was, oh, in a span of three months, we're going to build a satellite. We're going to launch it, and we're going to be golden. Um, it ended up taking more like three years <laughs> from the start. But um, um, so the, the the initial start was getting the design done. So we said, okay, let's let's look at the different subsystems the satellite needs to have. You have the structure, you need to place components somewhere, you need to have an aluminium structure. Um, and there's a lot of debate that goes in. You need, do you use aluminium? Do you use titanium? Do you use something else? Mm. Aluminium is the best trade-off in terms of its weight to strength ratio, mm. um, et cetera, right? So you have the structure. Then you have to be like, you know, the, there needs to be obviously a camera for you to be able to image it. Break the camera down into your optics, your sensor, your electronics. For you to make sure that it's all being automated, you need to build a computer. You know what chips are you choosing? What software are you writing there? For you to be able to orient the satellite now, okay, you need reaction fields, magnet arcers. For them to know which orientation are they looking at, you need sensors. You need sun sensors to be able to say here is the sun. You need star trackers to be able to say okay, here's a star field. Here is where we are. You need a GPS sensor, uh, which are uh. pinging off uh, other satellites uh, much higher up, saying oh this is where you are in terms of the orbit. Um, and then finally, you need to be able to power it all uh, autonomously. You, you have solar panels that you need to pay for, and then batteries that will store it because. In every orbit, you go through an eclipse period where you're not in the vicinity of the sun. Solar panels are not generating power. And how do you operate? Then you use batteries at that point in time. So you break it down into that. And we said, OK, let's find one engineer for each of these subsystems. Um, so the four of us were there. We broke a few subsystems into, OK, I'm going to handle control. Shitish is going to look at electrical. Um, Manas is going to look at all communication. Teja is going to look at structures. And then we said, you know, we still are missing a few people. Um, so we just went out searching on LinkedIn to, to see if uh -huh. we could get a few people on. But at the same time, we also reached out to a few retired ISRO scientists who were 
relatives of some of our friends at bits and we asked them hey how do we actually build a satellite <laughs> right and they were very patient in sort of helping explaining yeah this is wrong we tried this this won't work yeah this is a cool thing this might work um and and um, yeah as i said 3 months was the initial goal it ended up being 3 years but mm. um you learn almost everything right you learn how to build a computer you learn how orbital physics work yeah. you learn how power generation works so um that's how you started off and then you know, the raw materials are are your usual stuff that you will find on earth but all of these is space um, all of these is uh, you know built for space in the sense that yeah where the hell you find sun sensors <laughs> in indranagar bro like what are you talking about um look, look in, if you look at it from a physics perspective all you need is some sort of a sensor that can identify if light is falling on it or not it's essentially like a photovoltaic okay. sensor which is you know you, yeah. use, you can use it as a sun sensor you combine multiple sun sensors you insert it into a mathematical model you're like ah this sun sensor is on but this sun sensor is off and okay so the sun is probably this way and then as the satellite is rotating you then get okay this sun sensor was on 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 off 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 okay now you can use a mathematical model yeah. to here's the sun and what was the scale of uh, the satellite shakuntala right that's the first one that you send to space yeah. with spacex yeah like how many kilometers wide was it i mean i <laughs> I, re- i read that it was 15 kg so probably smaller yeah or uh, maybe i'm used to like seeing sa- satellites of scale yeah. uh, through yeah. popular media yeah but essentially like you must still have like a uh, you know idea of scale when yeah. you're building this yeah or well, why did you decide to like say build a light satellite as opposed to like a heavy duty and secondly how does a government allow just dudes to build a satellite <laughs> isn't that like a like a major regulation issue so uh, to answer the first question the size of it is the size of a mini refrigerator okay uh, right you will find the beer fridges uh, 30 cross 30 cross 30 cm cube to be precise um, it's it's not bigger than that that was actually dictated from how big our camera had to be so we were like we need to make it as compact as possible because lower size means lower cost means lower yeah. launch cost also uh, all of it is just easy to handle and everything else but the camera decided it and the camera that's also physics related you know that my customer is asking for a certain resolution of image from 500 km what optics do i need for me to get this resolution hmm. that decides the optics size that decides the camera size and that decides the satellite size in turn so um 15 kg sort of ended up being the minimum size of the satellite we could do uh, for the demonstration that we wanted to do with shakuntala and in terms of you know how does the government allow uh, uh, someone to do it i mean any any technology worth its salt uh, from early on to now even computers was always access limited it was only governments that could do it at a certain point but when when technology starts getting democratized when components start getting cheaper smaller you can you can barely stop the you know i would say the the onslaught of the advancement of technology um, and it's had started in the us private companies are already doing it in the us and in india uh, our plea was simple as a country we should not fall behind um, and uh, you have to reach out to the government obviously they need to register the the satellite as a space object so again the united nations maintains a registry of space objects every mm. space object that's launched has a id assigned to it and everyone is tracking where it is in case you know it yeah. is going it goes and hit something else in in space even if you like casually throw a toilet paper from your satellite that's also a space object <laughs> Yeah yeah the the thing is they no one will allow you to have a <laughs> toilet paper on a satellite it, it's the the rocket launchers they are very careful about what they let on to the rocket you need to uh-huh. show a series of tests you have done before you put it on there uh, the government needs to be proved that there's nothing hazardous here yeah. that no other country is going to come and create a diplomatic issue there right so in in our case our cameras are mainly used for agriculture climate forestry and and what not not really for surveillance as such yeah. so it's not really an issue but for much larger satellites than ours where you are able to identify maybe individual um, individuals and cars and number plates and things like that in that case yes that is a lot more strictly controlled um, like uh, like in the case of rockets rockets are more controlled because uh you know with a change of software you can convert a rocket into a missile at any point in time but with satellites lots of companies have now launched it it's not uh, if if we are not doing it as a country we are just being left behind so take me through some of the conversations that you were having with isro and like the government when you were asking them or maybe petitioning them to say hey we're going to launch a satellite in space uh did spacex come in earlier did you first convince the government did you take patents like what was happening so <laughs> it's a funny story when we started in 2019 india didn't have a space policy for private space companies it was only isro that was doing stuff you were the first we first are ever? the first indian private company to launch an imaging satellite we're the only one still date that has an operating satellite up there no one else has launched a satellite that's indian in nature that's c- imaging in nature that's commercial in nature 
so when we started in 2019 again there was no clarity for the government it was only isro that was building satellites building rockets we called up isro as students and we were like hey uh, we want to build a satellite we want to launch it will you launch it for us we will pay you uh, didn't know how we would pay them but we were like would you do it for us uh, the response we heard was uh, uh, you know we would love to we would love to help you in any way we can but there's no process for us to launch an indian satellite from from a rocket if however you were a foreign company and you came in and told us we want to launch it then there's a very clear way that that was i mean that didn't make any logical sense right you were supposed to be first making it easy for uh, for your uh, uh, country folks to be launching it but anyway things changed in 2020 when covid happened and uh, things went down what happened uh, was the finance minister uh, amidst the slew of other economic relieving measures said we will open up space the private company should be able to do it so when it comes from the top the prime minister is the minister of space as well um, and when it comes from the top then things open up so there's still two factions in isro some people wanted to stay as it was status quo there, but there are thankfully a lot of other people that yeah. want to open it up to private industries and then things started to change then we were initially supposed to launch in a soyuz rocket um, we had booked out a soyuz rocket because that was the, the, the those were very transactional people so yeah. they, they said you pay us money we will you know launch your satellite for use we like, like how you just went that. half rush in there <laughs> um yeah i thought about it <laughs> but decided against it so but you add to cart that stuff like how does that happen like not as uh, easy as add to cart spacex has kind of made it as easy as add to cart you can actually go on to their website and if your credit card allows you to pay a million dollars then you can book it on on their website <laughs> that's insane so you pay a million dollars to be on is that much how, how much you pay for 200 kg so it's a million dollars for 200 kg but since you are much smaller it's about 5000 to 7500 dollars per kilogram from spacex today when that's we it? when we booked it with uh, so use it was about 25000 so it's actually one fifth in in a few years It's not that bad. It's like a college student uh, tuition in the US for one year. Yeah, it's a college student. It's it's a college tuition for some universities in India as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just like okay, don't go to college. Just send a rocket. Just yeah. send a satellite into space. Five thousand dollars per kg. If you're building a kilogram worth of a small satellite, yeah. you can launch it for five thousand. Maybe I just have a lover. I want to send like one kg of like roses. <laughs> I can do that. Um, There were startups that were actually looking at sending uh, ashes of dead people to space. Like that makes no sense. Send probably. send. Here's a final send off. That's some kind of like legacy stuff that only billionaires would do, right? Like, okay, I want to be preserved forever so that, like, in some ancient, like, in some futuristic time. Yeah, but so the thing is, it'll only just burn up again, right? It will re-enter Earth and <laughs> burn up again. I don't think they're at the small print <laughs> of that. Um, so I don't, I, w- I do want to get into hyperspectral imaging because I think that's very interesting. But I want to take it a notch up back and talk about your time at HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, because. combine helicopters who does not love that <laughs> uh i've only heard them going up when i look at the sky yeah uh, never actually been in one mm-hmm. just been to the ones in vishnu devi uh <laughs> and just how, just out of curiosity so what happens when you work on combine helicopters um what are the specs of the kind of helicopters you worked on and did you ever design any weapons for them <laughs> just like just what was that experience like yeah you're going to get me in trouble but no <laughs> no <laughs> didn't really work on any weapons at all um worked on the design and structure of the chetak helicopter that's something i remember but look it was around the same time we were doing the hyperloop pod as well mm. so honestly uh, most of my time was spent focused on the hyperloop i barely went into the internship that's an internship that happened during a span of 3 uh, months or something but the internship helicopters i people would like <laughs> pay half an arm for that you know? um the good thing that came out of it is they uh, had a sit on a in a helicopter it didn't take off but they still allowed the five of us that were there to sit in it yeah. uh, but uh, from a work standpoint it was fairly boring it was uh, evaluate the structure uh, and evaluate how strong it is and where Nothing there's hands weaknesses on? Nothing hands on no it was mainly designed the only thing hands on was just sit in the helicopter yeah that's cool yeah so now talking about so i mean first of all i think i've now understood higher uh, satellites thanks to you very good uh, encyclopedic definition that i can uh, bring back home and hopefully cut out a youtube shot of <laughs> um but I was checking like what kind of imaging do satellites typically have something called orbital imaging something else and then hyperspectral what does that mean and also I think at this point it's fairly uh, important to define what does pixel do in space exactly beyond sa- like there must be a certain purpose to sending a satellite up in space it's not just like you can put it up in your LinkedIn saying I send satellites into space so what is the kind of is it a service that that your company offers is it uh maybe you respond dslrs up in space like like what's happening <laughs> so um the the vision statement for the company uh, uh, and that is the goal with which we started was to create a health monitor for the planet right and that's kind of sounds <laughs> how it is there's a lot of things happening on our planet it's a very complex biosphere 
um, mm. weather changes lead to people living or dying in certain certain places right global warming is going to lead to certain cities being submerged avalanches happening without warning etc allegedly <laughs> so to be able to to keep a track of global phenomena uh, what's happening where is it happening how has it been changing and what can you glean from this to predict some things in the future that's the the vision um, that's there have a software platform that anyone can log into like you do google.com and instead of searching for uh, you know what's the closest coffee place yeah. you search for uh, uh, how much corn is going to be grown in this country this year or uh, you know what is going to you know what is the temperature of this volcano here and it should give you an answer from but how do you actually collected. map that and the, and like a follow up to that is is not existing satellite imagery or satellite companies enough to do that job yeah no so the that's where our hyperspectral imagery comes into the picture so when we started there are already a few companies doing earth imaging in space globally uh, as we discussed no one in india apart from us but in globally mainly in the us and one or two in europe people had launched earth imaging satellites the first private satellites started to go up in 1990s uh, and then things started to get smaller in the 2010s and now we are really at a point where we can do it as well right so there are three types of imaging technologies when you talk about optical imaging uh, using your lenses mm. the the first is called rgb imaging everything a phone the picture we take from our iphone is an rgb image what that means is we are seeing things in three wavelengths red green blue rgb so it's like thinking that the computer that is our brain is receiving data in three channels and we are computing and recreating the world from three channels there has been an improvement on top of that called a multispectral imager which is a multispectral satellite if you have seen these night vision goggles that the army or the spies use in movies where you're mm-hmm. not able to see anything in the dark but then suddenly you have night vision goggles and you're able to see a thermal signature yeah yeah, yeah. what that's happening is you're going beyond rgb to a few infrared bands so the satellites up there have three bands which is rgb and they have a few infrared bands so your information channels are increasing now from 3 to about 5 to 10 max that is what existed when we started we said let's look at existing data can we analyze this data to see things happening and then we came across this imaging called hyperspectral imaging what hyperspectral imaging was is imaging the kind of multispectral imaging but on steroids mm. it's information in hundreds of wavelengths in our case 300 wavelengths mm. and it's not just distinct wavelengths it's every wavelength from visible to infrared range mm. so you are not missing any gap in the electromagnetic spectrum a lot of things that our eyes are just missing out because we can't see are mm. being captured with hyperspectral images what that translates to in the real world is let me take an example of uh, an agricultural farm with an rgb satellite i would be able to look at it and like i would with normal eyes be able to say here is a farm here is a building here is the city nothing more than that yeah multispectral satellites today can help you do a little bit more one step beyond that they can tell you health status of the crop that you are not able to see you can't tell if it's dying or not dying uh, unless it's at the end of life and, and they do that through like checking the thermal or heat signature in the soil yeah two infrared two or three infrared bands they will yeah. tell you the health of the crop is good bad average that's about it yeah. nothing based that, on just imagery because based on just imagery uh, yeah. that your wavelengths your eyes can't see but computers can they don't need to correspond with like physical data like that's they don't right. need to have any sensors in the ground that's right okay yeah, no. you are cap you're capturing a photograph from space that photograph comes down you're just analyzing the photograph no other data mm. hyperspectral imagery if you capture the same farm with a hyperspectral imager some of those wavelengths are still telling me that here are crops and this species of crop because each each thing reflects a certain light each thing has a certain spectral signature so what happens is in those 100 wavelengths each of those wavelengths has an information point some of those wavelengths tell me okay this is the species of the crop some other wavelengths tell me that there is a pest infestation here some other wavelengths tell me there is a crop disease here some mm. other wavelengths tell me oh, this is the level of water in the in the crop what that means is now i'm getting a more 3d reconstructed image of what you are actually mm. seeing in the spectral range along with the spatial range that's really where hyperspectral science another example is if you're looking at a a gas pipeline which has a leak we will never be able to tell with our eyes if there is a leak multispectral satellites also can't do that but that methane leak or any other leak stands up very clearly in some of those bands so mm. as you flip through the pages of a hyperspectral image some of those pages will be like yeah here's a methane leak so that's uh, why we say our tagline is also seeing the unseen those mm. additional hundreds of wavelengths that we are not able to capture that today's satellites in space are not able to capture we wanted to do that with hyperspectral this technology was already being used in the medical domain in the food processing domain in the medical domain it's used to identify between cancer cells and normal cells in the food processing domain it's used to identify rotten fruits from the inside which are not able to see from the outside you're taking that and saying we're going to do that for the planetary mm. scale no 
one else was doing it privately um so we said if no one else is doing it might as well build and deploy them ourselves and how expensive is it to um equip a satellite with hyperspectral cameras is is that very expensive is this is an expensive piece of technology is it something that you can build at home for practically no cost <laughs> it's definitely not something you can build at home for practically no cost you can build a 1 kg satellite for practically no cost at home but there's no utility to it in the real world it's a experiment mm. for a hyperspectral camera and then a satellite uh, without taking an exact number we are in the low millions of dollars per per satellite uh, right which is essentially 8 to 30 40 crores per this, satellite depending on yeah, the size we spend almost 40 crores on one camera for a satellite one satellite it includes satellite. the camera but includes solar panels and everything else as, okay. as well right uh, the camera itself might be 10 crores to 20 crores or something on along and who, those lines and who manufactures this do you ship it do you um, so we design the camera uh, we have a optics team and a camera team that like oh this is how it all goes together and then we work with specialist manufacturers who have large facilities to you know diamond turn those mm-hmm. optics or build mirrors and things like that and they say oh here's a design great now we're going to manufacture these things individual components it all comes to the facility integrated together it becomes a camera then and then it's put on a satellite so that's how that that becomes a satellite i was just looking at some of the economics of what you do <laughs> and i'm stolen this from one website a news website i have not cited it because i forgot to It says for Pixel, the primary source of revenue is selling data to clients. For instance, for a client who wants to monitor a thousand acres of land, Pixel prices the ima- imagery at one dollar per acre. If you say that to someone who's in real estate, they were gonna like lose their shit, right? Because uh, this gets further calculated on the number of weeks they want to monitor. Normally, Pixel strikes multi-year deals with clients. What kind of strange economics is this? One dollar per acre from space. Yeah, but you have to uh, keep in mind that there are. literally hundreds of millions of acres of farmland around the globe mm. not all of the people monitoring all of those farmlands will pay for it and we don't need them to but these farmlands need to be monitored on a daily basis or sometimes every 3 days or sometimes every week depending on which client it is and then that quickly adds up so it's not that we are just doing it one time and forgetting about it our clients want to know how a crop is doing today how it is doing tomorrow if they're you know irrigation levels that's dropped is there a pest infestation that come in is there a crop disease that's come in mm. so when you have even for example let's assume there's a 1000 acres for a client and we are charging a dollar per acre so mm-hmm. that's $1000 per image and we are doing it 52 times a week uh, so 52 times a year times 7 and that quickly really adds up to uh, millions of dollars of contracts with our clients so Uh, we mainly work with large enterprises or governments or cooperative societies hmm. um, who in turn deal and convey this information to the farmers we don't directly work with the farmers yeah. you know it doesn't make sense to they won't understand it but there are cooperatives and companies and governments who we provide the advisory to who then in turn end up you know impl- imparting that that information there so that's that's how it works so it's one time large capital expenditure spent on putting satellites up there but once you do that mm-hmm. you are taking images on a daily basis for certain use cases and that quickly really you know returns back the revenue and uh are your do you have someone at your base like if i can call it a base in nagar space station <laughs> uh who is constantly monitoring the satellite yes. has constant communication with it 24/7 and are they using maybe a remote control to program it or is it already on a standard orbit yeah it's not 24/7 um you don't communicate with it 24/7 there are ground stations around the globe whenever the satellite comes above the ground station only then we it is communicating to us we have programmed the satellite to say tell us how your health is so tell us how your batteries are performing your solar panels are performing mm. this performing this performing so we get a sort of a health status check every orbit and that's every every orbit is 90 minutes so a satellite is orbiting the earth every 90 minutes so every 90 minutes since it goes over at least one ground station and orbit we get to know what has happened over the last 90 so minutes so it's it's covering the entire span of the earth in 90 minutes just one orbit in in one orbit it's so think of it like this in orbit 1 it's going over india in orbit 2 it will be over bangladesh in orbit 3 it will be over china okay. in orbit 5 6 will be over japan so it keeps shifting and in one day it comes back to almost the same position uh, 24 hours yeah, um, the same as the sun but and the moon. an orbit is every 90 minutes got it got it and so out of sheer curiosity I was looking at some of the other stuff uh when I I searched how many satellites are up and I was trying to figure it out so I came across two companies 
and they were on the Airbus website. So I'm not sure how it tracks up. Starling does forestry images, which is a combination of radar and optical images, and Shale Scanner does provides insights on drilling, fracking, completion, and oil production. Mm. These guys are already doing it. So like. Yeah, but they're not doing hyperspectral. So regardless of. So what's I mean like is it something special? Yeah, you need to build hyperspectral sensors in a very different way. It's a physically different way of capturing information. So let me give you a very crude analogy. Hmm. If you had internal bleeding. you wouldn't take a picture of your abdomen with a iphone camera and yeah. see oh there's internal bleeding there you go to a mri scanner or an ultrasound scanner that tells you due to the the way you're sensing things through sound or through mm-hmm. magnetic resonance imaging that oh here is where the problem is it's how it's 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 like that between between uh, multispectral versus hyperspectral you can't see some things with multispectral you need to build a hyperspectral in a different way it it's not as simple as saying this is a multispectral i'm just going to upgrade it you can't upgrade it. you have to build it from the scratch so that's hyperspectral from day one hmm um further it, i was just looking at some of the stats of like the kind of satellites that are owned by companies that are up in space look when we were growing up i mean have you seen the nasa wale bahut khatarnak hai meme the nasa have you seen the nasa wale khatarnak hai meme mm, oh <laughs> no i don't think i have okay, it's a, it's a very funny meme <laughs> uh, it's just uh, from the game man anyway uh i was looking at the stats spacex spacex has about 1655 satellites nasa only has 60 aren't the national space agencies supposed to have more hegemony over space what is this new trend where private space exploration organizations are have more satellites So think of it this way: it used to ha- it used to be space agencies that had hegemony over space because only they could afford to spend on a satellite. So these satellites were huge because the components were huge and uh, it took years to build. Um, uh, they took hundreds of millions of dollars, if not tens of millions of dollars, to manufacture, which a private company couldn't do. But what has happened is components have gotten cheaper, smaller, more efficient. So now you can take a take a component that would have gone in your laptop, shield it a little bit, qualify it a little bit, put it on a spacecraft, and it will reliably work for a few months or a few years. Mm. And that's the democratization that has happened that has allowed private companies. to be mm. able to say i don't need tens of millions of dollars i can do it in single digit millions so instead of spending 200 million on one satellite like nasa would have done Sp- spacex is spending 1 or 2 million dollars per satellite and launching 200 of them right mm. um now there's a big difference here communication constellations also starlink is a communication internet communication constellation they require tens of thousands of satellites because you need to connect every part of the globe and you can't have it go down at all with imaging satellites they don't need to be everywhere at all we are not here for 24/7 surveillance once mm. a day twice a day for us is sort of good enough um so it was never really nasa's prerogative to connect the world or generate revenue nasa was more towards okay what can we understand about our planet so that's that's what that's where things have changed mm. it's become financially and economically viable for companies to spend hundreds of millions on these number of satellites and know that they're going to generate revenue in a few years yeah and out of curiosity what kind of companies own their own satellites like maybe they commission it through people like through companies like pixel like let's like just say i'm an amazon i'm like i need to get access to what is happening in like the new lithium reserves that have emerged in K- kashmir like i just want to know like what's happening like like will i just like have an arm of my company commission some people to go and say okay make some satellites for me is really that simple like what is no it doesn't make sense for everyone to build their own satellite so that's why there are specific companies whose job it is to operate those satellites so we for example own our own satellites we never the ownership of the satellite never changes we are building it we are manufacturing it we are putting them in space and we are operating it our product is the data the information we are in the information business hmm. what someone from amazon in hypothetical example they would want to know about lithium deposit somewhere they would come to companies like us and say hey you have hyperspectral imager you can very clearly see where lithium is we are going to pay you for an image over this area so what we do is we sell them the images of mm. that area other companies can also come in and and pay us for those areas or someone could come in and say hey i don't want anyone else getting images of this area i'm going to pay you 10x the amount yeah. don't sell it to anyone else it is exclusively mine things like that so um, uh, and the reason why it doesn't make sense for every company to build and launch their own fleet of satellites is because it's still quite expensive to launch a constellation the reason why the economics work out for us is it's a one time capital expenditure spend but we have 10 companies similarly in agriculture paying us for the same land we have mm. companies in mining or oil and gas or forestry paying us so all of that quickly add up but if it's a only a mining company building and deploying their own satellites for their own purposes the only use case they have is mining so it doesn't get spread out across multiple things you are not the back of the envelope calculations don't even really make sense so you need someone who's 
selling that same image to 10 different companies of the same kind and across multiple industries a private company in that space will not have any incentive to sell to their competitors why would they yeah i've seen a bunch of use cases on the website where it's around agricultural mining uh forestry but what are some interesting use cases that have struck out to you where companies are using satellites for ways your satellites or maybe other company satellites in ways that you did not expect hmm i think that's a interesting one um So I think I've been fascinated with volcanoes um and so with hyperspectral images you can get a lot of um, initial feelers and metrics that tell you whether something is going to blow or not <laughs> right really um even before the the lava the plumes actually start to show up using infrared bands and everything else we can tell oh it's you know heating up here uh, the vegetation has changed here the soil characteristics have changed here all that means something is happening you should probably take a look here right mm. that's a cool one um and then there are general you know health uh, people now want to know how much carbon is stored in anything or how much carbon is being emitted anywhere right and that means forests forests are the world's biggest carbon absorbers and therefore it's important to know how much carbon is actually being absorbed and we can do that by estimating biomass by looking at the carbon content in the leaves um that i think is an important one if not a cool one but i think the coolest one is definitely yeah um being able to look at volcanoes uh, regularly and seeing how they have changed uh, mm. right hopefully we don't have a yellow stone you know, on our hands a lot of people in bangalore are founders a lot of people have companies a lot of people have uh, massive funding we see funding insane valuations most of them work on the internet or on land <laughs> out of curiosity what are conversations with other founders like because it seems to me that one can ascertain what fintech is what edtech is what you know things here are but uh do you find yourself looking like an anomaly when you speak with other founders because is there is there a lack of awareness when you speak about what you do with with other people operating in the same city for example Yeah so I think uh, there's there's two kinds of startups right there's two kinds of work that you can do you can either work on something that is making human life more comfortable you know the food deliveries the e-commerce and everything else those are making our life comfortable and then there's the other kind of work which is actually propelling humanity as a species forward and the second is where i tend to gravitate towards in general again massive respect for anyone trying to make lives easier like you know danzo and swiggy make my life easier personally but i would never be able to work on something like that just because i don't think that's moving humanity as a civilization forward mm-hmm. um if you were, when you're working on space technology like all of us use maps uh, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to have um the kind of logistics and the travel we have if there were satellites that were not providing us guidance or weather 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 patterns and weather predictions and things like that right um so that's really where um, i think i'm personally attracted to so yeah def- not a lot of people not a lot of people working on something like this but i have seen personally a change in the kind of companies that have come up there is a lot more hard tech startups working on things like these mm. there's companies building higher uh, efficiency batteries in bangalore there are companies that are building higher efficiency thrusters and propulsion units that we can host on our satellites um there are companies that are uh, you know biohacking looking at crispr and things Love like bio-hacking. that and things like that right so i think uh, th- that change has definitely come in i don't know how it was 5 years 10 years ago but i'm fairly sure uh, the number of companies doing that was was much much lesser And how do you? What do you do in LA when you're in LA? Like what? What kind of work do you do there? <laughs> the reason why Los Angeles. I mean, people think of Los Angeles as the city of movies and Hollywood, which is true, but it's northern part of LA. If you actually drive down south, that's really the city of the future. If you look at El Segundo, south of the airport, you have companies building rockets. You have you know SpaceX there. You have other rocket companies there. You have companies like us building satellites there. You have other companies building nuclear reactors there. So it's essentially like when you look at city of the future, El Segundo doesn't look like it from. outside it's ugly ugly <laughs> uh, cuboid buildings um but the future is being built there so we had to be the biggest market in the world you know we started out of india we built in bangalore uh, and building in india for the world we can't not be in the united states which is the single largest buyer of satellite data probably more than the next 10 countries combined um and the natural place for us from a talent perspective and from a ecosystem perspective was to be in la so what we do there is um we do a little bit of r&d there in terms of you know uh, having the talent that has worked at nasa and jpl uh, which is you know right north of los angeles as well um and a lot of business development to to ensure that the companies that want our data can get our data awesome um and what about hiring I've been asking this of a lot of founders that I've interviewed mostly because 
I think each person has their own specific process. Um, some businesses are very tech heavy. Some businesses are coding heavy. Some businesses are culture heavy. And there's different ways to do it. But when you would hire someone, are you are you looking at previous satellite space work? Are you looking at location? Are you looking at former experience with, say, national aeronautical agencies? Like, how do you make decisions? Like, this person is going to work on my satellite. We look for potential. We look for. Uh is this person going to grow into the role most of our people haven't built a satellite before at all they have been in adjacent industries they have been in say the electric vehicles industry they have worked on batteries they have worked on uh, other kinds of you know hard tech but uh, we don't specifically i mean it's 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 really helpful if someone has worked on space technology before because a lot of things you only learn from experience and mm-hmm. bangalore has an abundance of that uh, the ur rao satellite center which is the satellite center for isro where all satellites almost all satellites are manufactured is in bangalore um, so we have few folks who have come into the team from that level of experience and it's easy to hire um, uh, you know very in indranagar and in domlur is really where the ur rao satellite center is we were also lucky because there was this team called team indus that paved the way for a lot of space startups they started much before anyone else they were quite frankly ahead of the time big inspiration for me they were participating in the lunar google lunar x prize uh, they were one of the fi- five finalists globally to be selected there they weren't able to raise the money finally to launch the lander or rover to the moon but they actually built it in bangalore in jakur um, and people that were there who had come previously from isro have the experience of realizing a lunar rover and a lander it's very sad that it end, didn't end up you know going to space at all but then thankfully when when people were looking at leaving that company due to the financial situation we were in the right place at the right time to be able to say why don't you come here we are looking at it's not as cool as lunar rovers yet but we're building satellites so that really helped shore up some level of experience and then it's zero and then now we just look for potential now we have enough experience and expertise now we just want people who have shown previously that they can tinker that they can hack and that they can actually build something we just want someone who can come in and do shit Elon Musk wants to colonize Mars. <laughs> I was reading the website and it said that eventually you guys want to go to other planets and figure out if, if something along those lines. Yeah, so I uh, have a fundamental uh, difference of opinion about space colonizing space uh, compared to Elon. I do think it's important for us to colonize other planets. It's as a, as a f- stepping stone uh, for a lot of other things. Mm. But for us to actually explore our universe uh, right we can't find planets everywhere we can't carry a planet with us what you need are biospheres in space that we ourselves built what is earth in the end if you look at it if you zoom out to the solar system and you're looking at earth it is essentially a, a biosphere that houses life it's a spaceship orbiting the sun which is a biosphere that's there we need to figure out how we can leverage the nearly infinite amount of material in the universe to create our own biosphere so space station is a biosphere a very rudimentary one so i think really where the future of humanity lies is if we can build more space stations and housing and factories in space mm. and you can't get that material from earth it's it's counterintuitive for you to spoil earth more for you to expand into space it's always going to be the home it's always the cradle of humanity but uh, you know as an in interstellar it doesn't have to die there um where do you get the material you get it from the asteroids there's so much material in the asteroids that's where you get it from without polluting the earth and that's our step by step master plan step 1 yeah. build hyperspectral satellites scout the earth step 2 use hyperspectral sensors and other sensors to scout the solar system and the asteroids step 3 now that you know which which is where what material is where go and mine it to help create biospheres in space and then eventually you can create big enough spaceships to actually undertake interstellar voyages it will take hundreds of years to even reach the closest um other planetary system but in 1000 years or maybe 10000 years or 50000 years that's where we have to go so yeah dude if you build that please i am going to reserve a 4 bhk already <laughs> i would love to stay in space um honestly man i'm just mesmerized by what you've said i think you're on a different level without, <laughs> without sounding like a fuck boy uh and i'm really excited about what you will build i've never interacted with someone like you and um The space you're in is very exciting <laughs> and uh, you're fiercely articulate and passionate about what you do and uh, I thank you for being on those cast. You are way too kind with the words. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, just someone who loves space who is doing space shit. It's as simple as space that. Space shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh so where can people follow you, find you, find your company, all of that jazz? So pixel.space is our website. Uh, they can find me on Twitter. With the two uh, X's, not the three. You <laughs> land up somewhere else. 
<laughs> I am not sure we have ever tried <laughs> that, but uh, yeah, pi double xcl dot space, uh, not a single x either because then Google will sue us. Yeah. Uh, but pi double xcl dot space. Um, you can find us Pixel Space on Twitter as well, and uh, um, yeah, I tweet a whole lot about Pixel as well. That's the only thing I tweet about as well. Yeah. So yeah, you can find Super Twitter, cool. LinkedIn, and website. also if you want an entrepreneur who also posts their own satellite launches beyond Elon Musk, <laughs> follow him. Uh, anyway, this was Abhay Samad from Pixel on those casts. Uh, We'll see you all in the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, next episode comes out Tuesday and Friday. Take care. Bye bye. Sign off.